This week's show is sponsored by Plant Spectrum 32, the new full spectrum grow light from Mother. If you're looking for a sturdy, sustainable, waterproof light that will help your plants live their best life, look no further than the Plant Spectrum 32. I'm so impressed with this light. Not only does it look great, it's also flexible. You can stand it vertically on the floor, attach to walls or hang from racks. And this is one grow light that really will stand the test of time. The Plant Spectrum 32's casing is made from recycled aluminium and after eight years of use when the LEDs wear out, the LED board is replaceable for a fraction of the price of a new light. The Plant Spectrum 32 comes with a four year warranty and costs 189 euros. Visit mother.life, that's M-O-T-H-E-R dot L-I-F-E, now to get your Plant Spectrum 32. Mother ships globally, so wherever you are, you can make sure your plants get the light they need. Hello and welcome to On The Ledge podcast. How shiny are your leaves? That's what we're asking today. I'm your host, Jane Perone, and this here podcast is On The Ledge, your passport to the world of plants. Sometimes a listener question comes in that's just so good that I want to dedicate a whole episode to it. And so today I'm talking about a question from Emily about leaf shine products and what's the best way of making your leaves look all beautiful and shiny. And we'll also be hearing from listener Beth in Meet the Listener. My hand is aching today and that's because I've been spending so much time handwriting cards to my Patreon subscribers at the legend level who <laughs> there are a lot of you. I've discovered that through uh, doing this this uh, exercise for the December mail out. It's wonderful, though, because what I'm discovering is that I really do have patrons all over the globe. It's been wonderful sitting there looking at an address in Tasmania and wondering what it's like to live in Tasmania right on the other side of the world from me here in the UK or thinking about living in Long Beach, California or discovering that I have three patrons called Leah. How <laughs> unexpected was that? So it's been a real joy to write these cards and uh, I'm still going with them. And uh, the super fans who are getting posters, I am packaging up your posters also. And you should be getting those before Christmas, hopefully well before Christmas. Depends on what the old postal service is doing, of course. And we've welcomed some new patrons to the fold of late. Helen, Suzanne, Nick and Emily have all become legends and Chris has become a super fan. I'm enormously thankful to all of you who do donate either via Patreon or Co-Fi or just PayPal, because you really do help to keep the show going. And so it's been lovely to be able to put together your rewards for all your loyalty this year. And I know there are loads of you who can't afford a financial donation, which is absolutely fine, but you do loads for the show in other ways, promoting it on social media, telling your friends and generally bigging up on the ledge. And that's really important too. So thanks to all of you. And if you're thinking that this sounds like a pretty nice club to join, then do check the show notes at janeperone.com where you'll find details of how to get on board with Patreon. And if you prefer to give a one-off donation, well, you can do that via PayPal or via co-fi.com. And the wonderful Oscar Chung, a.k.a. Oscars Online on Instagram, who designed my card and poster this year for the Patreon mail out, has his own gorgeous T-shirt, which he is selling right now. It's the Watering Can 2020 Tour. So the shirt's a parody of band tour merch, you know, those T-shirts you pick up at gigs. So the band's called The Watering Can and the cities they're stopping at, off at are, of course, houseplants and also listing the country where those plants come from. 
I'll stick it on my socials so you can have a look at it there. And you can also find the link in the show notes. 10% of the profits from the shirt are going to Mental Health UK. So please support Oscar if you can. It's a really lovely thing. As I speak, you've got 10 days left to order the shirt. This works on a campaign basis. So 10 days left. Uh, The campaign ends, I think it's on December the 7th. So yeah, do get in and order your shirt now and support On The Ledge Listener and designer Oscar Chung. And final bit of promo, Legends of the Leaf. We've reached 50%. Woohoo! Yes, I'm happy about that, as you can tell. If you haven't pledged yet, there is an amazing offer for just for today. That's Friday, November the 27th. You can get 25% off pledges up to £75 using the code BOOKFRIDAY2020. So if you haven't pledged, now is an ideal time to do that. You'll get 25% off with the code BOOK2020. If you don't know what I'm talking about, well, Legends of the Leaf is my crowdfunded houseplant book, which is going to tell 25 stories about 25 iconic houseplants and also tell you how to grow them. Can't wait to get writing this book, so please support me if you can. Details are in the show notes or just go to unbound.com. Right, enough promoing. Let's get on with the show. And first up, let's hear from our Meet the Listener Victim. Well, I won't call them a victim. I'll call them a star. I'll meet the listener star, Beth. Hi, On The Ledge podcast. This is Beth calling from Ontario, Canada. I live on a farm near Lake Erie um, and I am a big fan of On The Ledge and very excited to be on Meet The Listener. Question one. You've been selected to travel to Mars as part of the first human colony on the Red Planet. There's only room for one houseplant from your collection on board. Which plant do you choose? I think I would take my, well, I call it the pot of succulents. Um, They're a gathering of succulents that I actually had in my wedding bouquet when I married my husband six years ago. And they're growing and thriving. I don't really know what plants they are, but they always make me so happy and remind me of that day. Question two. What is your favorite episode of On The Ledge? My favorite episode of On The Ledge is episode four about microgreens. I absolutely love to cook. And being in Canada, our winters are long and fairly dark. So I usually end up growing some microgreens in January, February, just to kind of make it through the darkest times of the year. And it's always nice to have something fresh on your plate. I also have two little boys who love the fact that they can plant some seeds and in pretty short order be eating them. And I'm always pretty impressed with how the next generation loves to see where their food comes from. And I am always suggesting to my friends that uh, microgreens are awesome. They ask me questions about it and I refer them to your podcast because it's a really good how-to. Question three, which Latin name do you say to impress people? I don't use many Latin names for the houseplants that I have. I don't know a lot of their names. I just enjoy their shapes and try to look after them the best I can. Um, But mainly because I've heard it so often said on the podcast, the Pilea peperomia is something I have said to my mom a few times because I was able to gift her um, some of the little babies from my plant. So I told her the, uh, the Latin name of it and I think she was pretty impressed with that one although she didn't uh, have the right conditions for it, so it came back to me. But that's okay. I think that's what houseplants are all about. Question four. Crassulation, acid metabolism, or gutation? I would say gutation is my favorite. It is such a cool thing to see. I haven't seen it on any of my houseplants thus far, but maybe one day if I get the right ones and the right conditions. I have looked at pictures online and seen those little droplets of water. Just has a little sense of whimsy to it, so I quite enjoy that. Question five. Would you rather spend £200 on a variegated monstera or £200 on 20 interesting cacti? 
I would go for the large variegated monstera as I'm sitting here looking at about a dozen small pots of various succulents. I quite enjoy them, but I think having a high impact plant like a monstera would really do well and it would kind of light up a part of the sun that I have in my home and give me something to look at in those long dreary months that reminds me of a more tropical warm summer. Thank you to Beth and if you'd like to be a part of Meet the Listener we'd love to hear from you. Drop a line to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com and my very capable assistant Kelly will send you details of how to take part. I'm particularly interested in hearing from people in parts of the world that we haven't heard from yet. So if you're in India, the Philippines... Spain, Poland, or one of the other countries we haven't yet featured, step forward. It's your time to shine. And talking of shining, it's time to get on with this week's topics, which was inspired by a question from listener Emily with the subject line, leaf shine? Question mark. And Emily writes, I recently received several peace lilies from a funeral, sadly. Fitting timing with the Katie Vaz episode. Yes, you'll remember my episode with Katie Vaz, the illustrator, where she talks about peace lilies, a.k.a. spathivillums, being a common plant at funerals, which they certainly are. And Emily goes on. I noticed one in particular seemed to be sporting unnaturally, in caps, shiny leaves. It got me to wondering about these leaf shine, in inverted commas, products I've seen in the garden centre. And I wonder if you could teach us a little more about them. What are they made of? Where did they come from historically? Are they detrimental to the plants you intend to keep long term? I.e. do they interfere with photosynthesis or some other leaf functioning? Will these products come off with my routine wiping slash dusting of the leaves? I've never felt compelled to add extra shine to my plant's leaves, so I find this all very curious and interesting. Well, so do I, Emily, and that's why I wanted to get to the bottom of the leaf shine business. And joining me to help answer this question is Larry Hodgson, a.k.a. the Laidback Gardener. And the first question to tackle is, what's actually in that can of leaf shine? The thing is, you never know, because if you look on the label, it won't tell you. However, it contains various products. It could be silicone. It could be different oils. No one really knows what's in them. You could check it out. You could contact the company and they'd probably give you the information. But essentially, it's a a shiny coating that's applied over top of the leaf. Larry's right. It's really hard to find out exactly what is in that can or spray bottle of leaf shine. I've done some digging and looked at various product sheets for different leaf shine brands. And there's not a lot of illumination to be had there. Some of them list various things like naphtha, which is a a solvent, a petroleum based solvent. Some of the products list butane because I think that's what's used as the propellant for the aerosol. While another listed its active ingredient as pinene. What's that? Well, it's a chemical that's found in the essential oil that you get from pine trees. And one type of pinene is the main component of turpentine. Other than that, it's just vague references to mineral oils and waxes and very little specific information about the ingredients. I did find a recipe for a plant leaf shine spray in a book called Practical Formulas for Hobby or Profit by Henry Goldschmidt. And this came out in 1973 and it lists the ingredients as PVP slash VA 1-535, 3 to 5%, Carbo Wax 1500 at 0.20 to 0.35%, Isopropanol at 31 to 29% and propellants at 65%. So obviously that's roughly what we're talking about here. How long have these leaf shines been around? Well, I couldn't find an enormous amount of information on the history of leaf shine sprays, but I did find a book dating from 1933 called The Chemical Formulary by Harry Bennett, and it did list a recipe for a leaf shine spray in there, which didn't sound that much different from the ones we use today. So so they've obviously been around for at least, well, 90 years and probably a bit longer. So could leaf shine actually help our plants? Over to Larry. 
No, it's not going to be good for Leeds. It's not going to be good for several reasons. The, the most obvious one, of course, is that many leaves have their stomata on the top and the bottom. And if you spray it on the top of the leaf, you're blocking their breathing pores. Stomatas is how they, how they breathe. So yes, a reminder, stomata, or stomata if you prefer, is the breathing holes of the plant. And if you spray something onto the leaf that's going to block those holes, well, that's going to reduce the amount of gas exchange that plant is able to do. So you're keeping the plant from breathing correctly. So that's not going to be good. Also, some of these products, not all of them, some of them make the leaf more sticky and it'll pick up dust and that'll block the plant as well. It'll cut off light. And if you happen to have cats, for example, at home or, or dogs that shed, it'll make the leaf very covered in, in, in fur, which is not good either. One thing people don't think about, though, is that if the leaf is shiny, extra shiny, abnormally shiny, it is actually reflecting light. It's not absorbing light. So you're cutting back on the light that the plant gets, and that's a major one. Now, it only it decreases that by a small amount, but still, most plants indoors just get barely enough light to survive. You don't want to block the light that get, gets into them. So that's uh, three different reasons why they're not such a good thing. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I really don't fancy having Wolfie's. I mean, Wolfie doesn't shed very much, but I still don't want his hairs sticking to my aroid leaves. Uh, it's not a good look. And that point about reflecting light. Well, that's a really good one that I hadn't thought of. Yeah, every little drop of light counts when you're indoors where light levels are so much lower. So by spraying on leaf shine, you might actually be reducing your chances of optimising photosynthesis. There are other factors to consider when thinking about shining your plant leaves, and that's to do with the location of the stomata, because monocots and dicots have different stomata distribution. What's a monocot? What's a dicot? Well, a monocot is a plant that has one seed leaf when it germinates, and a dicot is a plant that has two seed leaves when it germinates. Now, that may seem kind of irrelevant to how their stomata is arranged, but here's Larry to explain why it's actually pretty crucial. Dicots that germinate with two seed leaves, they usually have leaves with an upper surface that does all the work as far as absorbing light, and undersurface is where the stomata are formed. So they're not going to be as harmed as much as plants that have stomata on both surfaces, and that would include all the monocots, the ones that germinate with just one seed leaf. And that does include a lot of plants that we grow in our homes. Orchids, for example, are monocots. The entire family of aroids, and we grow what? Monsteras, philodendrons, Diefenbachias. They all have no matter on the, both sides of the leaf. Then the, then the Sansevierians, Dracaenas. They're sort of, we're slowly ticking off most of our common house plants that shouldn't, that shouldn't use that. Plus, if you read the label on leaf sign products, it'll say things like, do not use on plants with hairy leaves or fuzzy leaves. Okay, that's one down. Do not use on new growth. Well, that's another thing down. You end up saying, well, exactly what plants can I use it on? Oh, don't use it on succulents. They'll say don't use them on succulents. They usually have stomata on both sides of their leaves too. So you sort of say, well, what exactly can I use them on? And, you know, it's a limited number of plants would be the answer. <laughs> so how come it's still so common to find plants that are sprayed with leaf shine, particularly if you buy them from florists. Well, if you take a look at the advertising around some of these leaf shine products, you can see the attraction from the florist's point of view because they advertise themselves as reducing transpiration. In other words, the loss of water vapour from the plant through those stomata. And how does that benefit the florist? Well, of course, if the florist got a plant sitting in their shop for a few days waiting to be sold or indeed sitting at a funeral, if transpiration rates are reduced via the use of leaf shine, the plant is much less likely to suddenly wilt. And as we all know, with peace lilies, that's something they're very prone to do. So the florist can keep the plant looking nicer for longer and therefore have more chance of selling that plant. And these leaf shines are also used on cut foliage displays for a similar purpose like wreaths and things like that to preserve the foliage for as long as possible even when it's detached from the plant. So I can really see why they're popular with florists but I'd argue that they're not a product that you need to use on your plants at home. 
I think the first thing to do is change our mindset about shininess and leaves. Because yes, some leaves are naturally very shiny. Very few have that high gloss that leaf shine gives. And the idea that this should be our aesthetic, well, it's a bit off track to me. Let's enjoy the natural patina and texture of our leaves as they are but not worrying if we can't see our face in them because applying leaf shine, well, it's a bit like applying a really bad Instagram filter. Yes, it may make things look a bit better from a distance, but look up close and it just looks really odd. And Emily asked if this product will come off her leaves. Yes, it will over a period of time, I'm sure, with wiping with a damp cloth, the leaf shine will gradually come away and the plant will be absolutely fine. It won't cause any long-term damage. So how do you keep your leaves free of dust and debris without using leaf shine? There are so many remedies out there and most involve using something from the kitchen cupboards, it seems. I've heard of mayonnaise, milk, castor oil, coconut oil, lemon juice, the inside of a banana skin, and even vodka being used to shine leaves. What a waste of vodka. Before you raid your kitchen cupboards, let's go back to Larry to find out what he thinks. Most of those products are quite sticky, so you're going to have that problem of of dust accumulating, and you don't really want that. It's one thing to make your leaf shine day one, but if on day 25 it looks awful, that's not going to be any good. So uh, I'm not in favor of putting anything on a leaf. I just say let it let it live its normal life. There is some evidence that a spray containing milk can help with powdery mildews as a way of killing the fungal spores that cause this condition. I'll link in the show notes to an article that goes into the science behind this. But if you're looking for a general cleaner for your houseplant leaves, the non-hairy ones, the best thing you can use is a damp cloth. Ideally, water that's distilled or rainwater so it doesn't contain any of those mineral salts that can cause those white deposits on leaves. And if you can, it can really give your plants a boost to give them the occasional shower. This will not only clean off the leaves, but also help the potting medium too. Here's why. Over time, as you water, and especially when you add fertilizer to the water or add fertilizer to the soil, Minerals slowly build up in a pot. Now, outdoors, that wouldn't happen because rain is going to flush it out. So outdoors, you're, you're getting that happening. But indoors, when you water, the water goes into the, the, the tray at the bottom just a little bit, and you sort of leave it there. And so that sort of it never goes anywhere. And so t- as time goes on, the minerals start to build up. At first, that's not a problem. But over time, they eventually get to the point where they become quite toxic. What happens is that when the mineral concentration is greater outside the leaf than inside the leaf, it pulls water out of the plant's roots, and that's never good. In fact, most of the time when you see brown leaf tips, people tend to blame it on chlorine or something like that. It's not chlorine causing the problem. There's a buildup of minerals in the the soil, and it's time to either rinse it out or repot one or the other. Thanks to Larry Hodgson for providing such expert advice this week. And you can find Larry on the internet as laidbackgardener.blog. So do you want to come with me while I go and clean some plant leaves? Yeah, let's do it. Oh, that was a big yawn, Wolfie. Well, we're in the uh, <laughs> we're in the front room now and I have ready my cloth. Are you going to sit down, Wolfie? On the sofa, up. I have with me my cloth ready for some leaf shining. So this is just an old muslin from when my kids were babies. You can also use a ripped up uh, t-shirt, anything, any fabric that's soft and isn't going to do any damage to your plant leaves is ideal. And I've just soaked this in a bit of rainwater. If you've got hard water, use rainwater or distilled water if you can, because that way you won't leave any salty mineral salt deposits on the leaves and make sure this is at room temperature as well if you really want to spoil your plants because that will make sure that the plant doesn't get a shock from freezing cold uh, cloth and when you're deciding which leaves to shine well anything that is hairy is out I tend to clean those up with a soft paintbrush or clean makeup brush 
but any plants that have got glossy leaves can be wiped down. We're obviously focusing on the top side of the leaf. As we've discovered today, many of the monocots do have stomata on both sides of the leaves, but the top layer is the bit where you tend to get the most dirt accumulating for obvious reasons. And while you're doing this, you can have a really good look at the leaves and check for any pests that might be hanging out. And if you use a white cloth, then it's quite satisfying because you can actually see how much dirt you're getting off. Okay, now the dog's whining to go with my husband. Hang on a minute. How you go? Go and find Daddy. Go and find Dad. Off you go. <sighs> Alright. So, back to the plant leaves. So I've got here a Tradescantia spadacea. Well, Tradescantia spadacea. And there's actually three different varieties in here. And while I'm at it, while I'm cleaning the leaves, I'm also going to remove a few dead leaves that have served their purpose and need to be picked off before they fall off. But just gently wiping those leaves. Never press down or do anything harsh to the leaves because that will damage them. So just be very gentle and place your hand underneath the leaf and then the other hand, usually have the cloth in the other hand and then use that to wipe. That way you're supporting the leaf as it's cleaned and it's not going to get damaged or crushed by the action of your cleaning. These leaves are looking better already. And if you've got a spray like SB Plant Invigorator, you could also spray your plants down with that first and then wipe. But in this case, I'm just using rainwater. And if you do find any leaves that are damaged, it's up to you, it's a, it's a call really, as to whether you want to remove those or leave them where they are. Damaged leaves are never going to totally recover. They're going to stay damaged. They're just going to be replaced by new leaves. So you need to make a judgment call as to whether the damage that's there is so unsightly that you want to remove them, whether it will leave a, too much of a gap. And that really depends on the type of leaf and the arrangement of the leaf as to whether you want to do that. Right, let's put this Tradescantia back. And in fact, while I'm putting it back, I'm going to leave it slightly turned so that the plant will naturally... Let's put it down properly. Um, the plant will naturally turn towards the light. So by turning it regularly, it means you're getting a balance for the plant. And now I'm getting this umbrella plant, which I think needs desperately needs repotting. Let's have a look. Mm. Well, <laughs> there are some roots coming through the bottom. This may be due a repot. It's produced beautiful new growth. And it's wise to be very, very careful with the new growth because new leaves are very, very delicate. Until they've matured and kind of hardened off, they're very, very vulnerable and they won't have had much of a chance to build up a lot of a deposit either. So I'm going to leave these this very new growth alone. I'm only cleaning the established leaves because that way I won't do any damage. I'm really not a sort of a meditation kind of person, but I do find cleaning plant leaves is very therapeutic. Now I have got a plant whose leaves I wouldn't really use uh, with a damp cloth. This is an alocasia black velvet. I'm not sure if I'm going to clean this or not because the leaf has got a very slightly hairy texture. 
And I tend to avoid cleaning this one with the damp cloth technique. I think it will probably be fine, but this is probably one that I would put into the bath and give a good shower to rather than trying to clean it with the cloth just because of the texture of those leaves. I'm going to go over to my table that's closer to the window because I've got a few things here that definitely need to wipe down. My Hoya Kerii variegated form is very beautiful. Ooh, I've, not, I've got pine cones on this table, I'm knocking them now. The obcordate leaf of the Hoyakerii, so that means that it's heart shaped and the heart joins the leaf stem at the pointy end, not the other end. And these are really are quite dirty actually. Just going to put a bit more water on my cloth. looking better already. Oh crack, sorry about that. And then finally I've got my beautiful Raphidophora tetrasperma which I've recently taken chunk off to propagate for Listener Lauren and this desperately <laughs> needs a wipe down. Again this is a tricky one because it's got the very incised leaves. You've got to be really careful when cleaning it to make sure that you don't damage them. So my hands underneath the leaf as I gently wipe. I'm going to just make the cloth a bit damper. The good thing about these old muslins is they do absorb an awful lot of water so it makes them ideal for this purpose. I've just removed one yellow leaf that had served its purpose and was ready to come off the plant. Now this plant's leaves look great when they're clean, but it's not a plant that needs a high gloss. That's just not how the leaves look naturally. So this is why leaf shine for me just doesn't do anything. This plant also needs watering probably repotting as well. Now I'm a bit of a multitasker and I like to sort of do things while I'm doing something else, maybe listening to a podcast, but this certainly is not a job that you can do sitting in front of the TV because you really do need to concentrate. It's really easy to end up damaging these leaves by accident. So maybe something to do while listening to on the ledge. And it's amazing the dirt that's coming off these leaves. If you've got a wood burning stove in your house, you may find that you get particular types of deposits at certain times of year, times of year. Or you may find that certain times of year in the UK year here in the UK we get dust in the air. And that can come inside and land on your plants. And if you're having building work done or you're sanding floors or anything like that, do try and take your plants out of harm's way because they will be affected very easily. Just turning the plant as I go to make it easier to access all the different leaves. And if you've got a big plant, it could take you quite a while. So this is why I don't do this tremendously often. But you don't need to do it every, every week. It's something that you can do whenever the plant seems to need it. And that's more about observing your plant than anything else. Well, that's all for 
this week's On The Ledge podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'll be back next Friday. Have fun shining your leaves this week. And here's to naturally healthy looking plants. Bye. you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops and I Snossed I Lost by Dr Turtle. The ad music was Whistling Rufus by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra. Tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit janeperone.com for details. Music